What is up, Cinefiles, and welcome back to Screen Kings. For today's video, let's do another movie roundup of the movies that I've seen this past week. Kicking things first is this Netflix animated film called The Sea Beast, directed by Chris Williams. He's the director behind the films Big Hero 6, Bolt, and he also co-directed the movie Moana. Now, in this film, we have a young orphan girl named Macy who aspires to be a part of this group of sea hunters including a swashbuckling hero named Jacob Holland as they take on biggest sea creatures of the archipelago. Now animation-wise, this Netflix original is vibrant, it's colorful, and there's an opening sequence here involving sea hunters being pitted against sea monsters couple of times to showcase how well staged the action sequence is, whether it comes to the tidal waves or the deep water shots featuring bioluminescent life. I think this movie is pleasing visually though i wouldn't put it on the same level of animation when it comes to disney as to the voice work everyone's doing a great job this movie has a great sound design and music though it doesn't have that signature theme song that's almost integral to be noticed when it comes to the award season now this movie has already been trending on netflix a couple of days from now but i gotta be honest it took me a while to actually watch it because upon seeing the trailer i wasn't completely hooked just because the plot elements to this film are just awfully familiar. We have here a group of sea hunters. You can liken them to the crew in Pirates of the Caribbean. And then we also have this kaiju-sized monsters seemingly like coming from Pacific Rim. And then Jacob Holland who has a similar backstory to Peter Quill from Guardians of the Galaxy. And then the dynamic of Jacob here and the young girl is pretty much similar to Maui and Moana. And then the titular sea monster here, Red Bluster. I am reminded of Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. So upon seeing the trailer, I already have this template in my head on how this movie is going to end up and true enough, as soon as the movie shows an inclination on who's the real villain behind this, it pretty much falls down in a predictable fashion. Enemies are fought, lessons are learned. Nothing really surprising happens in the film. And the fact that this movie clocks for almost two hours, I gotta admit again that I watched this in two separate occasions. What surprised me, however, is the complexity when it comes to the themes of this movie. You can watch a uh, surface level animation featuring yellow cutesy characters speaking gibberish, but if you want depth into your movies, this one definitely has it when it comes to sentiments about anti-colonialism and historical revisionism to which I'm really surprised because it's pretty much mature themes that is well explained to a younger audience without the need of ever being too preachy or force feeding the message. For our main characters, Jacob and Macy, their arc is going to be about challenging conventional beliefs, realizing that sometimes becoming a hero does not mean that you're automatically on the good side. From the get-go, this might be one of the movies that winds up with the message that you need to be courageous in facing your fears but as the movie progresses it actually talks about courage in standing up for what is right and going against the crown if needed to so overall this one appeals to a lot of ages i would say though as an adult it didn't appeal to me as much as Mitchell versus the machines but i have to admire this film for refusing to dumb itself down and having complex characters with tangible arcs so the biggest gripe for me here is it can be really derivative especially if i'm reminded with the title here the sea beast it feels really bland i'm gonna go on the middle ground and give this a three out of five next up is another netflix film it's a zombie action thriller film called valley of the dead or its original spanish title Malnazidos, directed by Javier Ruiz Caldera and Alberto de Toro. The movie is set in Spanish Civil War where we have fascists versus anti-fascists, Republicans versus Francoists, and then we also have Nazis who are fighting against each other and once this mini zombie outbreak happens, they need to set aside their differences so they can survive this apocalypse. Now, this is just not a zombie outbreak just for the sake of it. There has something to do with the zombies being used as a biological weapon. Now, when it comes to zombie films like this, the first thing I look 
as someone who has seen a lot of this is is there something new to be offered in the genre to be blunt there's really nothing new here the zombies are slow and you need a clean shot to the head to knock them down and when it comes to the tropes of you know survivors meeting another survivors and i would say the kills they're pretty much something that you've seen in the previous films or previous shows that you have watched but that does not mean that this movie is not something that you can enjoy because this movie has high production values it features a lot of beautiful landscapes in spain and even if the script screams of b movie it doesn't feel like it because the gore is fairly minimal and i appreciate the director for showing restraint because it's all for the better i haven't really seen a movie that's set on spanish civil war so i am intrigued to watch this one when it comes to the tone of the film i would say it's more of an action thriller but more of a light-hearted thriller i wouldn't say it as a comedy right away like zombie land so i would have preferred if, if it became more satirical poking more fun on the political differences here but we certainly have characters here who make fun of the situation to make this film lighter than it's supposed to feel so it doesn't feel overly serious or overly horrifying like Train to Busan. So it fits into that middle ground. Now the characters here, I find them all likable, actually more likable than the characters in Army of the Dead. And I wish we got to know them more, but we got the right amount of screen time to be acquainted with them. I guess the most investment in here is Captain Jan Lozano, played by Mickey Esparbe. He has a good dynamic with the rest of the cast. There's good banter here and as to the cast, we have different culture here. We have nuns, we have Muslims, we have different people with different political beliefs. So there will be an eventual disagreements and clashes here, but the movie does not drag them. It's pretty much still action packed. So in the time of one hour and 40 minutes, I felt like I got a lot of here. And that's always a good sign. Whenever it comes to a zombie apocalypse, we're all on the same boat. There's no strict protagonist or antagonist in this film. Maybe except for the Nazis because there are the outright villains of this film. But yeah, I have a lot of fun watching this movie even if it's heavily reliant on zombie tropes. If you have that itch to watch a zombie film, this will scratch that itch. So I'm gonna give this again a 3 out of 5. It's technically competent, therefore it's watchable to me. The next film is also coming from Netflix. It's an Indian indie film called Dear Friend, directed by Vinit Kumar. This one tells the story of six Malayali friends, four of which are roommates and are involved in this startup business. The first half of this movie is pretty laid back. We see these friends hanging out, partying, pulling pranks against each other. So it feels nostalgic. It feels like a feel-good coming of each film. The friendship that they've shown here is really believable and I instantly like them from the get-go. Now, when it comes to the second half, it becomes a mystery thriller as one of the friends disappear. I wouldn't say an outright thriller because it gives an impression that this movie is going to be fast-paced from here on out. It is more of slow and meandering and i think that's the best way to attack this subject matter because this is more of a mood piece as the friends start to unravel the real identity behind this missing friend that they thought they knew fully well so they might have to reconcile among themselves why this person need to do those things if you ever felt ghosted by someone i think you can relate into this movie especially it has a lot of sentiments to say when it comes to modern friendship in this milieu that we are becoming i would say more materialistic when friendships are mostly based on transactional value like you won't be friends with someone if you're not gaining something from them that might be a bleak thing to say but it's reality and it's okay because friendships need to be mutually beneficial to foster a good relationship so the movie basically just gives out this question like what constitutes a good friend and it's easy to write off one character here as the bad person but as the movie progressed you get to realize that each of the characters here have their own ulterior motives you know a lot of talks about hypocrisy and some contradiction so it leaves more food for thought so in the end i think this movie might be polarizing and the way it ended it's meant to be anticlimactic 
that being said, I wish they kind of rewrite that confrontation towards the end and just maybe add a catharsis to it. If you want something that's spelled out specifically, this might not be the movie for you, but if you thrive on looking for open interpretations in the nuances or the subtlety that this movie has when it comes to friendships on how they die sometimes without closure, this is the movie for you. So for me, I'm gonna give this a 4 out of 5. I haven't really seen a lot of movies about this and even if there's an ambiguity and incompleteness to the story which normally turns me off, I think it just ends on a realistic note. So yeah. Then for the final one, we have Thor Love and Hunter directed by Taika Waititi. So basically here we have Thor now joined by Mighty Thor who is formerly Dr. Jane Foster and along with their friends Valkyrie and Korg versus Gore the God Butcher who's seeking to eliminate all the gods for some reason. Now this movie is getting I think a lot of mixed reviews when I try to look online but when it comes to blending the genre, I think it's pretty common for Marvel these days to use different tones when it comes to their film. The latest one being Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. The treatment is a superhero horror film and this one it's comedy superhero film. That being said, I think this movie is first and foremost a comedy then a superhero. Now normally it would turn me off but I'm not gonna deny that I had fun watching this movie. Usually superhero films they're serious then you long for some comic reliefs. So the case is different here. It's quite reversed. It's actually full of comic reliefs then you're looking for that dramatic relief. Sometimes it does feel like a parody but if you're looking at the montages here or the flashbacks here I felt like they're all necessary to tell the story of Thor to bridge the gap because we're basically trying to piece about what happened on the relationship of Thor and Jane here from part 2 and to this part 4 Thor film and as well as giving a recap of what happened in the previous Thor films and considering that we've seen so many MCU films at this point I think a little refresher won't help and a little comedy goes a long way. So if you're going to compare the first Thor film to the recent Thor film, they are vastly different by now. But honestly, if I'm to pick between the two, I would still pick the latest one. And I love the way Taika Waititi infuses his offbeat humor here. He makes everything silly but not in a stupid way and admittedly there are times that he does a bit too much to make the movie sound clever but most of the time i am impressed with his irreverence when it comes to directing that being said since this movie leans more on the comedy sometimes it kind of undercuts the dramatic pathos that is needed in some of the scenes like personally there is an extended scene here involving Zeus played by Russell Crowe he plays some sort of a campy version of Zeus and I felt like that scene went too long I know that scene is necessary to basically set up a future Thor sequel but for me I would rather have more screen time here for Gore the Good Butcher because Christian Bale is easily the best performance in this movie I am really intrigued by the concept of faith and religion that his character is grappling and yeah he kind of disappears in a good chunk of film and I wish I got to learn more about him about his race I think visually the movie also picks when we are taken to this shadow realm so I enjoyed those scenes. As for Thor, Chris Hemsworth, he's really solidified himself as an effective comedian when it comes to this. Not to mention that he just keeps getting bigger and bigger for every installment. Ever since Taika handled Thor Ragnarok, he was able to make Thor a more compelling character because he's basically a god. He's the self-proclaimed strongest Avenger, but he still grapples with a lot of human insecurities, he feels lost, he feels jealous, he feels fear. So those moments of vulnerability is something that audiences really need to connect. So as each installment, he becomes more likable. And then Jane here, Dr. Jane Foster, she is a big major part of this movie. I think there's an overdue focus here on Dr. Jane Foster and Natalie Portman. She really pulls off her 
action stunts here. She looks like she's having fun and I love how the movie empowers her without going into blatant messaging about girl power. But yeah, and the rest of the supporting cast is still a pleasure to know more about them for Valkyrie and Korg. And the soundtrack is just jukebox fun. We have a lot of riffs from Guns and Roses. So overall, this is not a perfect film, but I would say this is still a must watch in the cinema because this is summer escapism. Don't be turned off much by the focus on the comedy because in the third act, there will be a pathos here. So I'm gonna give this a three and a half out of five. That is already good in my book. So I wouldn't say that this is the goat of all Thor films. I would still put Ragnarok in the top spot, but this movie has actual goats in it. So it might be the most random thing ever, but it's really hilarious every time they pop in the screen. So yeah, that's it for my review for all the four movies that I've seen. Let me know if you've seen any of them. Hit them on the comment sections down below. Also, if you enjoyed watching this video, hit that like and subscribe to me for more content. Thank you so much guys for watching. Until then, I'll see you all on the next one.